Okay, so basically the Black Student Movement is a group of um, individuals that came together in solidarity with BCT and what was happening um, regarding their conversations around transformation. One of their primary conversations was about the uh, symbolic removal of the statue, but at the heart of what they were talking about is issues around transformation that we found to be similar here. Um, the Black Student Movement doesn't have a leader. We all um, congregate in this very fashion, in a, in a circle, in a democratic circle, um, and we raise objections and points about how to further our conversations on transformation. Um, what was the initial moment which sparked this was the group of students brought together, sat together, in the rain actually, and we started dealing with a couple of issues around transformation. So we realized that it was not just um, curriculum, it wasn't just the fact that we were called Rhodes University, it wasn't the fact that we um, don't have the right mechanisms for working class students, but it was also about the microaggressions that we find in the pedagogical space. So that, out of all of that, we started having more and more conversations and from there we resolved that we would be the Black Students Movement. Um, a lot of people have been responding about the fact that the Black Students Movement is potentially alienating because of the word black. The reason why we call ourselves the Black Students Movement is because of the teachings of Franz Fanon and um, Steve Biko. And blackness here refers to a political identity. So if you take seriously the movement of black consciousness movement, when it started, you'll find that there was a multiracial group of people that aligned under the same theoretical principles and they were serious about taking down apartheid and the structures that informed apartheid. So it's not about the melanin or the color of your skin, it's about what you think seriously about um, political mobilization. Um, we are all very, very excited to have Dr. Aubrey who is um, one of the founding members of the Black Consciousness Movement and um, an incredible force of light for all of us who I think are doing the same sort of popular um, movement and action that um, they did within his day. So thank you very much and thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak to us and engage with some of the students with their concerns. Thank you. Good afternoon. I think I should stand here because if I'm in the middle of there, I'll give my back to some of you guys. Not so maybe I should be here, or should I? Or do you prefer me to be there? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really privileged and very pleased to be with you, with you guys, uh, students, primarily to come and express my solidarity and support for uh, your struggles as students here on this campus. Uh, and all the other students who are engaged in struggles uh, everywhere in this country. The recent upsurge in uh, student activism is very pleasing to a person like me and those of us uh, who know the important role that students have played in the struggles of people all over the world. One need only think about the student movement in France uh, in the 1960s, uh, which was very huge and led to the overthrow of the autocratic president Charles de Gaulle. All of the student movement in the Americas in the 1960s also, uh, that spearheaded the anti-Vietnam uh, war campaign when the Americans had invaded Vietnam in search of what they called uh, communists, when the Vietnamese were merely wanting to attain independence. That movement was led by students and ultimately led to the uh, it led to the withdrawal of American troops. In, in Cuba, uh, some of you will know that uh, Fidel Castro and, uh, uh, and his brother Raul began their campaigns uh, against imperialism uh, when they were students at the University of Havana. Uh, and they ultimately uh, went on to overthrow the American Lekki, who was then President Batista. Uh, they overthrew him, and not only that, they went on to lead the Great Revolution, Cuban Revolution, which led to the establishment of the only successful socialist state in the Western Hemisphere. We shan't talk about the achievements of Cuba, etc. today. That's for you to research and know. But one of the great things about that little island is that, amongst other things, uh, it hasn't experienced poverty, 
uh, in spite of all the things that they say about human rights and so on, it has the lowest illiteracy rate in the world. It has the highest per capita number of doctors, engineers, many of whom they're exporting to countries in Africa which got independence at the same time as Cuba, but which chose another trajectory instead of socialism. The Cubans are exporting doctors to Zambia. They're exporting uh, engineers even to our own country. That, that, that's, uh, that's about Cuba uh, that you guys will research on your own and about the merits of the system of socialism as opposed to capitalism, but that's for another day. Uh, we're talking about student activism. I come from a movement called the South African Students' Organization. I'm actually a founder of that movement, and uh, we as students uh, in the 1960s began this journey uh, of questioning, uh, of questioning uh, and trying to find out where our position in society was. Where, first of all, where our position in that university was. And, 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 and the natural next step, where our position in society was. When we went to, and this I think uh, has particular relevance to you guys, and, and the question of the name, because this is uh, one of the things I want to focus upon uh, today, a name and what a name uh, means. It is not true that uh, a rose by any other name is a rose. It's not quite true, even, Shakespeare, even though Shakespeare says that. A name is an absolutely important thing. It is an identity. It is that which gives you dignity. It is that which gives you uh, an ability to be, uh, to be productive because it, it, it gives you that spring in, 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 in your uh, in, 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 in your step to, to know who you are. Uh, those of you who are from my uh, part of town in KZN uh, know that mm -hmm. uh, a name is a huge, huge thing when you say to men, and, men, and when he says, I am Kize, he means more than just those letters that mean Kize. He means an embodiment of an entire uh, ethos, an entire uh, being uh, of what being a Kize is. And when he walks out there, he walks with that aura of being a Kize. But that is no different from other cultures. That's just by way of demonstration. When we go to the university at that time with Steve Biko to study uh, medicine in the 60s, our university was actually called the University of Natal Non-European Section, UNNE. Uh, if you check the literature, you'll find it. It's called University of Natal Non-European. And in our state of mental bondage, in our state of uh, unconsciousness, we blissfully called ourselves non-Europeans. We, after all, we were in the University of Natal Non-European. And we used to go to meetings, student body meetings, and rail and intone about freedom, about oppression, etc., as non-Europeans or non-whites. At least realizing that we are actually uh, the instruments of our own oppression. That in our heads we were not right. That in fact we were accepting the status that had been accorded us by our rulers. Uh, those of you who have read uh, A Right of the Leg, might have seen where Steve remarks uh, about uh, uh, mental bondage and, and he says the greatest weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. The greatest weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. So unless and until you liberate yourself mentally uh, you can never ever really be an agent of change in your circumstances and in your life. So it is important that you must liberate. And part of the process of liberating yourself is knowing who you are. Uh, as we engaged in student struggles uh, in that time, uh, there came a time when we realized, no, 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 no. We cannot be non-European or non-white. First of all, before, before that episode, 
uh, we have then been, uh, initially we've been affiliated to a student body called the Non-European Students Association of South Africa, NUSAS, which is a white controlled uh, national student body. We're affiliated to it in spite of the fact that on our campus there was hardly one single white. We were, after all, in a non-European campus. The only white person in our campus was, of course, the white warden to look after us, as, as happens in these cases, to look after the natives. But there came a time when we realized that the interests of the white students then, and our, our interests, were diametrically opposed. That whereas they wanted to reform the system, they came from the system, they were beneficiaries of the system, whereas they were, in fact, uh, a part and parcel of the system, we wanted to obliterate and overthrow the system. And that being in one organization, really, uh, especially white control, uh, would not take us any far in terms of our struggle. So we formed our own organization, which we call the South African Students Organization, SASO. But even then, we were not fully conscious. We just taken the first step in cognition, you know, we want to form our own organization to talk about oppression, how it affects us. After all, he who wears the shoe feels the pinch. Doesn't they say it goes that way? He who wears the shoe feels the pinch. So, we formed this organization, Sasso. But our first constitution, interestingly, <coughs> says, in the first line, it says, we the non-white students of South Africa. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if, even though we were like, throwing away the shackles, uh, throw away the handcuffs, but the, the leg guys still remained. It was only after a while that we, we, as a result again of struggles and thinking, dialectics, arguing, learning, that we realized no, 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 it can't be right that we should be named by our oppressors. We can't be non-Europeans or non-white. We can't be non-this or non-that. We, we can't be negatives uh, of other people. Uh, we are who we are, and, and we have a right to name ourselves, uh, and we can't be named by anybody. And then we decided that we, the black students, have realized our identity. And at that time, uh, we took what one may say is a quantum leap mentally in realizing who we are and who our struggle, what our struggles were. And we went on to change, this is important for you guys, we went on to change the name of our university from the University of Natal non-European section to the University of Natal black section, which it remains up until today. And that was officially accepted because we put so much pressure on the authorities that they had no option but to do that. But importantly, this gave us that leap, that mental leap, that ability, that, that spurt of energy to do more things, to engage in more struggle. One, the most important thing that we did and realized was that our struggles were not confined to the universities. That in fact, our st the struggles of the students were intertwined with the struggles of the people outside, mm -hmm. that working class, of the students, of the churches, of all the other people outside. And we, we in a way, we broke out of the universities. We, we got out of our universities and we started to immerse ourselves in our people. And we developed strategies as we matured and we grew, we developed strategies as to what to do. And one of the strategies that we adopted, uh, one of everlasting merit, which helped us ultimately in the war against the apartheid regime. And in that environment where the security forces uh, were so vicious, where uh, everything was a minefield. You could trap on a booby trap on a, everything. Uh, security agents, secret police, uh, draconian laws, etc., uh, etc. Et 
So one of the strategies we adopted is we formed an entire phalanx of organizations. Uh, we formed organizations specifically uh, intended for the church. We formed organizations for the youth, organizations for the workers, organizations. So the Black Consciousness Movement became a sprawling movement of interlinked, intertwined organizations. Uh, about 20 in all, if I should count them. Uh, all of them operating under the banner of Black Consciousness and a kind of a federal uh, web of organizations which helped us in that environment to be able to maneuver in the system. It, help, it helps us in many ways actually. One, to maneuver around corners and evade the authorities in the system. But secondly, it helped us to take the message of liberation to the doorstep of everyone. It did not entail for people to come into a university hall to come and receive the message of liberation because we brought it to their doorstep. We brought it to the churches, we brought it to the high schools, we brought it to the uh, uh, sports associations, we, we brought it to uh, the journalists, uh, organizations like the United Union of Black Journalists, the Theatre Council of Natal, uh, Azayo, Azanian Student uh, Youth Organization, uh, Black People's uh, uh, Convention, uh, uh, South, Southern African Students Organization, uh, which combined uh, all of the territories in the southern region, what is today called SADC, whose uh, uh, Secretary General was uh, a comrade called Comrade Unkuput Tiro, who was parcel bombed uh, in Botswana. Actually, he was one of our first casualties in the Black Consciousness Movement. He was parcel bombed in Botswana. That, that, that is the phalanx, the web of organizations that we form. The important thing about this is that we immerse ourselves inside the people. Now, that little history uh, uh, is important to, to show what, 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 the, what the change in mental outlook does. Uh, what, what, what happens when you attain a higher level of consciousness? And, and when, you, when you take charge, uh, not only of your environment, but of yourself, of your name, and naming yourself, and, and being able to name yourself. After all, every newborn child is named. In the, it's only in the new South Africa that things are not named. Then you wonder, how new, how new is the new South Africa? If the new South Africa retains all the old names, how is the new South Africa new? Uh, maybe it belies the fact that it is hardly new. Uh, as Pilger says, Pilger says in his book, uh, Freedom Next Time, he says apparently it is not dead. Uh, and Amy Cesar says every time, I listen to the radio and hear that uh, so many people are dead. I know that Hitler is not dead. Uh, and maybe indeed Hitler is not dead. When we hear of the people at Marikana uh, being shot, uh, then you know that Hitler is not dead. Apartheid is not dead. But coming to your specific case, I, I really am here to support you guys. Uh, I'm the current president of the Black Consciousness Party, uh, which is a rather small party, but which is fine. Uh, smallness does not mean ineffectiveness. And you should not be intimidated by the stomping crowds. <clears throat> what, is what is important is, is your, 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 the cogency of your message your understanding and your commitment to what you say and your ability to do things. Don't, don't, the stomping crowd will, or crowd will always be there. I don't need to tell you anything about Mr. Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes was one of the most odious, obnoxious human beings that set his foot in this country. He had the most absolute contempt for black people. I think you know all his sayings and what he said 
about uh, these natives must be kept, must be kept in the reserves and they mustn't mix with whites. And he says, these young blacks, in, he was, he ushered in capitalism into our country uh, because he was, a, he was a mining baron. He came from the diamond and the gold fields and they, and they were crying for cheap labor. And, 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 and the Africans, uh, uh, naturally, did not want to go and work uh, for them because the Africans had been an independent and proud people before the arrival of the whites. And uh, they saw no reason why they should leave their fields and their, and their heads to go and work for some other people. So they, they, in spite of conquest, they refused to go to the mines. And, and, and Cecil Rhodes has this to say. He says, we must get hold of these young men and take them, make them to go and work. Uh, and the only way to do that is to compel them to pay a certain labor tax. We must get hold of these young natives and, 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 and get them to go to work. And the only way to compel them to do that is to compel them to pay a certain labor tax. So that, that was a, a strategy to force people off the land because now they were, they were meant to pay a tax in money which they didn't have. Mm -hmm. And if they didn't have that money, they were forced to sell their stock, to sell their cattle in order to be able to, to pay that tax. And in selling their cattle, they became less and less independent because they now had no cattle because they had to pay taxes. He's the same man who says, uh, uh, in introducing the Glenn Gray Act, if you remember the history students among you, the Glenn Gray Act, there's an area in the, uh, in the Cape, uh, which up until then in the mid, uh, in the late 18, 18, 1870s, 1880s, uh, was still occupied largely by blacks, but it was a fertile area, uh, very fertile district. Uh, and and uh, Rhodes and his uh, cohorts and, and the farmers around there envied this land and they wanted to take over. And they introduced an act called the Glen, Ray, the Glen Gray Act. Uh, at that time, Rhodes was the, was the, was the, was the prime, prime minister of the Cape Colony. And in his motivation, Part of his motivation for the Glen Grey Act, he says about our forefathers, these natives are children. They have the minds of children. That is about us. So I don't know, uh, friends and comrades, how I would sleep easy in an institution named after them. Uh, I would sleep easy. No, how I would sleep easy in an institution named after a man who introduced the vicious system of capitalism in our country, whose effect we know when we look at the ghettos, the hostels, we look at the unemployment of our youth, we look at the, uh, the ravages uh, throughout our country, and we know they are wrought by this system, this system of winner takes all, this system of profiteering, this system of uh, exclusion mm -hmm. exclude students who can't pay, mm -hmm. exclude mm -hmm. people who don't who can't get work, exclude uh, those who don't have medical aid, exclude, 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 mm -hmm. exclude the, um, the majority. It's a system which only favors uh, the strong. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, it's a barbaric system. Mm -hmm. It's a system akin to what happens in the forest, mm -hmm. uh, and and yet. We are supposed to be civilized men. And uh, uh, I, I would say that uh, having this university as the University of Rome, one more day, one more hour, one more minute, is a slap in the face. Oh. <laughs> So comrades, this is, this is, this is where, where we are. Uh, I would further say 
We are a shame in the world as people of this country. We are, we are a scandalous shame that 20 years after attaining <coughs> so-called democracy and independence, we still go by the name that the masters gave us. We are still South Africa. Every single country in the world which has attained a level of independence has changed its name, named itself, should I say. It has named itself, Zambia. Uh, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, uh, every country you can think of, China, Beijing, which used to be Peking, uh, Mumbai, which used to be Bombay. Uh, everywhere in the world when people achieve, they mark their achievement by naming themselves, by naming themselves. Why in 20 years have we not changed our name to Azania? We will be running a campaign as the Black Consciousness Party, Black Consciousness Movement, for the changing of this country's name yes. to Azania, and we solicit your support. Mm -hmm. Thank you. giving us courage and hope. Mm -hmm. um, for, um, I'd like to take questions um, to... Oh, sorry, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> 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 I'm personally with the Black Rock being here and for um, introducing us. It's really gave us a lot of hope because it's been tough. Yeah. It's been a tough week. <laughs> it feels like it's been years. <laughs> but um, I just wanted to ask, how do we sustain these? keep it from dissipating because things like these are so fragile that mm. they break so easily and you know they can be as forceful but they can also just disappear as well. so how do we sustain a movement and keep it going as long as possible yeah it's a it's a complex uh, question for which there's no uh, one answer that fits all but the underlying que uh, issue here is commitment when you get that core of committed people uh, who know where they are going, who are clear about their direction, who are convinced in their own hearts. People, people, when we started the South African Students Move uh, organization, we were no more than 12, should I say. We were no more than 12. In three, four years, we had the biggest organization in this country. We created a black consciousness movement the size of an organization which had never been seen in this country. In every village, hamlet, township, squatter area, people spoke black consciousness. Even those that could not read its final, final letters, etc., they spoke because it gave them hope. And what you need to do is instill hope in, in your people. Because if you name this, and, and, and this, is my, this is my recommendation, uh, uh, after you have jettisoned the name Rhodes, uh, I know people say Mr. Rhodes contributed this, contributed that, and so on and so forth. That might be fine. He did so with blood money, first of all. Blood money. Today in the Cape Flats, in the Cape Flats, gangsters and drug lords are contributing money to school as uh, support. But should we say those gangsters uh, deserve our honor? Mm -hmm. Certainly not. Mm -hmm. So my, my suggestion and uh, uh, my very humble re uh, recommendation when, when you reach that stage is that this, this university should be named the Robert Mangaliso uh, Sobukwe <laughs> University. <laughs> I think we've got a bit of a difficult one for me, but I'll ask you anyway. Um, you know, as the Black Students Movement, um, at this, you know, post apartheid, and I think you spoke very well about how you guys had to take a quantum leap um, in terms of redefining or taking up their black identity. But I think, um, you know, a lot of people like you, uh, many, many people who've died have 
you know, contributed significantly to, you know, the black identity as significant. Um, however, I do think, and you know, I'm a proud advocate of the Mandela Day, of course, but that is not to say anything except that I really value the legacy of Nelson Mandela, which is that we're all human beings, um, and that the fact that, you know, someone was, the fact that race, the construction of race, um, and James Baldwin talks about this, is the first crime to begin with, that um, the fact that someone chooses to look at me, look at the color of my skin, and from the fact of it being brown, um, assume certain connotations that I am weak, speaks to their inferiority, and them having a need to want to make someone inferior so they can feel superior. So I do think, and I've said this too, if people are on the black, um, student movement. So, so I'm not really comfortable with the name for that reason. I don't think it's going to help us to politically mobilize, um, you know, to get people, um, the university, the, if there are workers in the university who are struggling, um, who, who need to be part of the cause. And if really what we want to change is the institutional culture of this university, you know, to come, for that to come from black stu a black student's position um, is already, you know, to sound, for the local better term, essentialist. Um, and I think we can all agree the university can get together and say, you know, this university is messed up and that we need to do something. So I'd just like to get your view on, on that world view, I guess. <laughs> well, if we, if we talk truly and really, uh, and we take uh, the, the, the visionary uh, outlook, there's actually only uh, uh, no different races in the world. It does not exist uh, biologically. There's only one race, and that's a human race. But if we talk in the real terms, we are a, we are a conquered people. Where our land has been taken, our labour has been taken, our land has been taken. You know, I drive regularly down to the K, to Cape Town here, and, and when I look at the land from Natal, where I live, right down, and I, I just see little blots. Uh, of uh, squalid little squatter camps. Mm. Uh, uh, I see rural slums called reserves. Mm. Uh, and the rest of the land has been taken. Mm. We are landless. And as a result of our landless, less, land, landlessness, we have to work for other people. In other words, we don't have our labor. We don't have our labor. Your father, my father, doesn't have his labor. He has to labor for someone, for slave wages. Yes. If you think about it. And, and therefore, our liberty is gone. And for as, as long as the economy, the, the basic economic relations in this country are in the control of white people, so will racism exist. Because racism is bolstered by seeing people who are inferior to, to you. And indeed, whites send us around, they do, except in the comfort of the university. But if you go out there, whites are still sending us around. They're sending our fathers around, our brothers around. This is the reality. And racism shall not die in this country. And I want to say that with, and repeat it, for as long as capitalism is existing. Yeah, sure. Thank you. all our members, A, to, to, to look at the concept document because it does deal with these kinds of things. But more importantly, that we need, <laughs> we are being called anti-intellectuals by a number of people. And I think this is where the real intellectual work is, is happening. So there's a strong understanding of black existentialism amongst these the group of people that are here. Yes. There's a strong understanding of humanism amongst the people that are here. When we say that we are interested in the work of Franz Fanon, where he says an, to open an open door of consciousness. Mm -hmm. Of every consciousness. Every, of every, every consciousness. Every consciousness. <laughs> is to access the universe. <laughs> to move from the zone of non-being into that which is being. Alright, so please, friends, please, we need to show 
in the same vein that our fathers did, that this is an intellectual engagement with the kind of dehumanization that has happened on our bodies and on our spirits. So please, if you are a member of the Black Student Movement or a member of South Africa, take seriously the literature that exists. There is a canon for us. There is a canon and it exists. Mika? I'm not trying to be 50 cents over here, but to yeah. add to that, <laughs> for non, though, before we get to the, uh, the recognition of the open door of human con every human consciousness, yeah. is you have to recognize the fact of blackness. Mm. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Historically, we can't unracialize ourselves. Yeah. We need to recognize that historical fact because whilst we're saying we are not, we're not a race movement, we have to recognize historically who have been the marginalized people and for what reasons being black. And from that point on, you're able to move forward. So you have to understand those things in context. And you can't undo race. It's happened and now we have to move forward beyond it. We can, but you have to recognize it, the fact of blackness. Thank you. I just want to add to that. The first victim of English colonialism with the Irish, before we came to Africa, before we came anywhere else. And if you look at descriptions of Irish people in English documents, they're described as black. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. described as dark, yeah. swarthy black people. Yeah. Yeah. Now, those are my ancestors. I don't look black to you now. <laughs> Blackness has never been about race. It's been yeah. about positions of power. Yeah. 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 Everybody has already um, said the answer to the question um, that was posed earlier on. But I just wanted to stress the matter that as the Black Student Movement, um, it's understanding this blackness and it's understanding um, this literature <coughs> that we have all united and we created a movement that has grown so much that people fear us as the Black Student Movement. <laughs> yeah. And we are still here today and um, diverse as possible, we are very diverse, um, but we understand what the Black Student Movement is, and that's why we're a part of it. But also, also to add on what has been said, uh, to answer your question, is that, like this, this, this thing of black movement, it's not more just like the road so white thing. It's not more of the skin color, it's not more of, it's more of the attitudes. Mm -hmm. and, and it's also, because that, if you are if you are seen as inferior, be it because of your color or be it because of whatever, you are black because like in the, the history, our history is the one that says black were inferior. And then everyone who is seen or uh, whoever like is seen as an inferior, then he should be associating himself with black and fight this thing of inferior and superior because that's what this movement is about. And and just to I don't know if the testimony or whatever, just today. In, in my in my in my class, like today we were learning about we were learning about menopause and stuff. And for some reason on the slides there it was it was given like the average age of of, of when people start to experiment or to show signs of menopause and stuff. And then that average age it was of coming from United States, they were referencing United States. Mm -hmm. And then my concern was that like since we are all mostly we're going to be practicing our pharmacy here at, uh, in South Africa and stuff. Mm -hmm. Why don't we get to see that? Like, because mm -hmm. people are going to be asking if, if say, I'm experiencing these symptoms now, is it, is it, is it a normal thing for me here in South Africa mm -hmm. to, to be experimenting this thing at this age and stuff? I should be able to say, yeah, it's normal because here in South Africa, <coughs> people are usually experimenting these symptoms at those, those mm -hmm. kind of ages. Like, no one saw a problem in that. No one saw that, like, because the same, I'm sure the people, like, are, I'm being taught on those slides, the same slides are going to be used for, for the people who be, who be, who be studying my, my degree next year. And then they will continue. If no one sees a problem in that, I feel like this transformation, everyone is yeah. saying that we, we are standing up for something that is stupid or uncivilized. I feel like if we don't have people who, who confront such things, then we'll continue losing ourselves, we'll continue not, know, not knowing information about ourselves, where we live in this
Um, if I may just take this conversation in a slightly different direction. I'd like to ask you for your experience on someone. One of the, the recent critiques thrown at BSM is that there's some sort of mysterious third force, some yeah. mafia yeah. behind us, and we deliberately don't have leaders per se. And I think this confuses people, but how do we counter that third force critique? Because I know uh, the black consciousness movement has been subjected to that over the years, and if you have an experience to impart on that. Well, it's going to depend on your fortitude and your, uh, the courage of your convictions, really. Uh, such accusations will always be there. I think we were called, uh, weren't we called the uh, agents of the CIA? Yeah. Uh, we were called, uh, I know because I live in that wonderful province called KwaZulu Natal, I was said to be an Inkata man. Uh, <laughs> I used to work in a hostel, uh, in an Inkata hostel. So they said, why, why don't I get killed because I'm working in an Inkata? It must mean I'm an Inkata. All these uh, slanders, slanderous statements are going to be made about you. But it's important that you should have the courage of your convictions because you are correct. Uh, it is the duty of every marginalized people, anywhere and everywhere in the world, and it is okay like that, whether it is in the context of black consciousness, whether it is in the context of the gender movement with, who, which, with, with which we identify, the female movement is a part and parcel, an ally of the black consciousness movement. Because you cannot say because women want uh, their freedom, therefore uh, why should they mobilize on their own? Why aren't they mobilizing men? Of course because the men are the problem, the yeah. women are the solution. Yeah. Similarly with the working class. The working class is working to working towards a classless society. But because it is working for a classless society, does not mean it should be in cahoot with the capitalists. Mm -hmm. It is there to liberate even the capitalists. Mm -hmm. But it cannot operate with the capitalists for the simple reason that their interests are different mm -hmm. diametrically. That's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. So it is not the, the, the fact of where you start does not negate where you want to go. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you want to respond? Yes. Um, yeah, I will say this. Um, I wanted to say, it sounds to me like I'm being accused of idealism, um, of being an idealist and you know, not you know, keeping a practical read and understanding what's going on. I think I have a reasonable amount of what's going on and I, you know, I think I've I'm um, in my own personal capacity tried to like change things in whatever way I think needs to be. Um, I don't think the two are inseparable. I don't think one can be an idealist and say let's try for a humanist society um, and not understand what's going what's going on in society. In fact, I think that's the project that needs to take place um, in South Africa that we all need to be honest about how a group of people who have been marginalized have been treated unfairly and how we all need to do something to, re to resolve that. Otherwise, if it's coming from a select group of students, um, I'm personally skeptical. Um, can I just respond to your welcome? Yes, please. I don't think anyone's accusing you of being idealistic. I think people are kind of finding it a bit troubling that there's this basic document, this basic set of principles that all the members of the Black Student Movement have signed up to. And you see, it was written between Lionel and Paddy. You know, this isn't some like exclusionary black document. This is the principles are there that we are an inclusive space, that we are a space to show solidarity amongst ourselves, and to show the solidarity with all the struggles around us. And I, I, I'm not sh I, I, he mentioned that people are talking about third forces. And I'm sorry, but it's you who's talking about third forces. It's you who's talking about this, this is not an organic movement. This, the, as Faye said, this movement started organically, showing solidarity to UCT, and grew from our own conversations with each other about our experience as black students, as marginalized students at Rose University. So I feel like in these spaces, it's very counterproductive to be going back to the basics of our policy document every single time. And I feel that you need to go and engage with us in, in other spaces, engage with our policy document, and then if you have a critique, I think we'll, we will all listen to you. Mm -hmm. But you need to understand what we mean, as Fazia said, 
as Mika said, what the black student movement means. And I think we're all willing to engage with you, but let, let, let's keep let's keep these yes, okay. debates into the right sectors. <laughs> no, I'm trying. I'm trying. Yeah, also I just want to, um, uh, maybe it would make more sense um, why we're called um, the Black Student Movement thing. Because I think for me, the one um, example that always comes to mind is feminism. People see uh, feminism in the same light that people see the Black Student Movement. But feminism is for gender equality. And if, you can, if people can understand that feminism is for gender equality, people can understand why the Black Student Movement is inclusive of everyone. Yeah. Can I just say, um, for all of us moving forward though, dissent is important and it is healthy, yes. right? So let us be respectful in our dissent and let us be respectful of other people's opinions because we come from different parts of the world and we understand the things that um, inform our livelihoods differently. So I encourage all of us, if we're going to be resilient and if we're going to be a force to be reckoned with on this campus, is to be patient with one another. Um, but also to be cognizant of what we are producing as a collective. And that is a serious work, that is serious intellectual work that takes blackness as a priority because of the centrality of black lives being marginal. But more than that, it is not, um, it, it is not averse to this idea of inclusion because like Jonathan said, this is a term that is used for power, right? So blackness is in relation. Um, Fanon even says that the, the white man knows the Negro because the Negro created the white man, right? So we need to be clear about those kinds of things. But dissent is important and dissent is healthy. Um, yeah? um, just to help, one good book that I read, this is my first time speaking and this is my second meeting, but I found this book to be very helpful. One great book that I read says, my people are perished because of lack of knowledge. And sometimes we might focus on the name and forget what we're doing. If you attended yesterday's meeting, you'd find that the agenda that these guys were feathering is actually an agenda that caters for all. We're representing the needy, not a specific, specific group. And if you look at it that way to say, who is the needy? Maybe it might be the majority might be black, but it's actually, if you're needy and you're white, you're not excluded. Yeah. Yeah. So it's high time we started looking at the job that this group is doing rather than the name, because you'll be, you'll be left yeah. looking at the name. Yeah. But I just want to remind everyone uh, at the, of the colloquium at Uhuru. Um, do you have the time? From 9 o'clock until uh, 3. Um, in the morning, we're going to have uh, three speakers. One of them is Raymond Sapna. The other is uh, Dr. Aubrey. Um, and we will also have a representative from Abbasali Basam John Dolo. In the afternoon, we'll have our own students from Black Student Movement. So we'll have Uli Shea, we'll have Ubuyo, who I can't see right now, and, um, <laughs> and we'll have Ute, Ute Mbani slash Zion also speaking to us. So, um, so um, I, encourage, I encourage all of you to, to, to just track them down. You can see their faces, track them down. If there's something in particular that you want to be expressed in that, in that space, please make sure that you consult them. But also please come to the to the colloquium. It's going to be an incredible space, and um, it's going to be an intergenerational space. And I think that's what we need, um, particularly right now. So thank you, and thank you. Thank you.